I'll, I'll Welcome everyone to our Montefiore Grand Rounds. It's a great pleasure today to introduce uh, Patricia Pelica, who is well known by everyone that has been in this field, even not for too long. Uh, uh, Dr. Pelica is a professor of medicine at Mayo Clinic. She has over uh, 800 publications in multimodality imaging. She uh, developed actually uh, stress echocardiography uh, in the late 80s. She has been the director of the ECHO lab at Mayo. She has been the past president of the American Society of Echocardiography and associate editor for Jack for Jack Cardiovascular Imaging for Jays for most of the, the, the imaging journals. So she's uh, one of the top people in the field in echocardiography. So I'll, I'll keep it short because we're running a little bit late, but thank you so much for joining us. She'll be talking today about stress echocardiography in an era of multimodality imaging. Thank you again, Dr. Pelica. Thank you very much, Leandro. It's really a pleasure and an honor to be here at Monty Hart. I'm, we'll talk about stress echo, and when I get done talking, I'm going to go and review stress echoes for the rest of the day. Stress echo is really a very popular form of stress testing at Mayo Clinic, and I think that attests to the fact that our clinicians find the information provided by it just clinically very useful. These are my disclosures, nothing particularly relevant to this. I'm excited to report that I will be the incoming editor-in-chief of JACE starting in about a year. Now, there are a couple important guidelines documents about uh, testing in um, coronary artery disease. And so this presentation is particularly timely. This one just came out. This was a collaboration between different imaging societies, including uh, ASE about non-invasive imaging in coronary syndromes. And this is a great document if you want the details about the imaging and how to do it. And then the other document, of course, that just came out is the chest pain guideline from ACC AHA by Dr. Martha Jubati and on cardiac testing for chest pain. This shows a figure from that document. And we can consider acute chest pain evaluation or stable chest pain evaluation. An important feature of the document is that for low risk groups, it's recommended that there is no testing. And it's reasonable to defer testing, but you might consider coronary calcification. For intermediate risk patients, you can do either anatomic or functional testing in the acute setting, the emergency department setting, and for high risk and intermediate risk in the outpatient setting with stable chest pain, you can do either anatomic or functional testing also. Transthoracic echo is recommended as a rapid bedside test for patients with acute chest pain to establish the baseline ventricular function, see if there are regional wall motion abnormalities, look at the valves, and assess for pericardial effusion. And sometimes in our practice here, we will do that echo, send the patient to the echo lab, do the rest images, and then if we're not finding anything, we will do the stress test. So it's one of the versatility features of echocardiography. The document also recommends consideration of the pretest probability of obstructive coronary disease in symptomatic patients. And we're all familiar with these scores that consider age, sex, and symptoms. But the guidelines now recommend that we use a newer score, like the Juarez Orozco score because the older scores, the old Diamond and Forrester, will overestimate the prevalence of coronary artery disease, particularly in women. And so the patients that are going to get the most benefit from testing, either with a CTA or with a stress test, are those with the dark green or orange. 
And the recent scores have added things to just the characteristics of, of pain and the age and sex, including coronary calcification, but other features, other risk factors for coronary disease. And all of these additions to the model seem to have improved and strengthened them. CTA really got a big boost from the PROMISE trial, uh, which looked at the impact of outcomes of doing either a CTA or a stress test. Of course, the, uh, the hypothesis of the study was that CTA would be superior to functional imaging, but here in their two-year results, they were really equivalent. And there weren't enough patients with the various forms of stress tests, particularly stress echo or exercise ECG, to really say much about those particular tests separately. But this has led to an increased use of CTA and its increased recognition in the guidelines. This is subgroup analysis for the primary endpoint um, in this trial. And you can see that even with all the different subgroups here, age, sex, race, um, pretest, risk assessment, CAD equivalent, pretest probability of coronary disease, really there was no particular advantage to either anatomic or functional testing. So when we come to choosing a diagnostic test, um, we need to consider these things. What is the goal of the testing? Do we want to rule out obstructive coronary disease or detect non-obstructive coronary disease? Or are we trying to use ischemia to guide management? Of course, if we're looking for ischemia, that would favor stress imaging, whereas this would favor CTA. The next question is the available expertise at your center and and certainly for centers that have uh, expertise in both areas or multimodality areas, you can have a, a choice. CTA seems to work a bit better in patients that are younger, that have a lower likelihood of obstructive coronary disease and stress imaging was better in patients that were older. Um, Part of this is that CTA can be challenging to interpret if there is heavy calcification of coronary arteries. And we found that in some of the patients we attempted to recruit for the PROMISE trial, the images were uh, non-diagnostic because of extensive calcification. Prior test results, of course, can be considered. If the opposite test was inconclusive, then you'll want to choose the uh, a complementary or alternative tests the next time. And then consider the other indications. If there are anomalous coronary arteries, or if you want to look at the aorta or pulmonary arteries, that would favor CTA. Whereas if you are suspecting scar or some microvascular dysfunction, this would be a nice thing to detect with stress testing, stress imaging that is. Here's a table from that same guideline document about choosing a stress test. And you can see that exercise treadmill tests, of course, you have to be able to exercise to do this test. Um, but stress echo and spect, stress spect maybe are um, similar here um, for patients that can exercise, or you can do pharmacologic stress testing. You can use it to evaluate left ventricular dysfunction or a scar. On the other hand, the advantages of PET and stress CMR, although these in most centers are not available for patients who were, um, where you want to do an exercise test, but rather require pharmacologic stress, that you can quantitate the flow with these tests. The guidelines also say that cost of testing should be considered, but do not provide RVU information about the tests. And this is rather tricky information to track down because some of the tests have multiple RVUs that make up the entire test. 
The guidelines also say to avoid radiation, iodinated contrast, or gadolinium during pregnancy or breastfeeding. The guidelines do endorse a rather prominent role for transthoracic echo in the differential diagnosis. But let's look at an example. So here's a case from our clinical practice. This is a patient who came to the stress echo laboratory with atypical chest pain. She was 71. You can see that her electrocardiogram at rest here really doesn't show too much. Um, it's somewhat unremarkable, perhaps a little bit of poor R wave progression. But look at her images. My goodness, there's a lot going on here. You can see that the distal septum is virtually akinetic. She's got a wall motion abnormality here in the infralateral wall. And in the two chamber view, the inferior wall looks severely hypokinetic. So multiple wall motion abnormalities. Rejection fraction is 44%. She had mild mitral regurgitation. And so we knew there is no need to do a stress test in this person. She's got coronary disease and she needs an angiogram. And so that is what she got. And you can see very critical coronary disease here. The circumflex is nearly occluded. She's got multiple lesions in her LAD and diagonal, but she's also got this critical left main stenosis here. A widower maker lesion here in the left main of about 90%. So this patient went for bypass surgery, but it just shows the efficiency of stress echo and uh, how we were able to make this diagnosis and get her to the hospital just very quickly without needing to do a stress test. In fact, if you looking at this angiogram, it would make you pretty nervous to, to think of stressing this patient. The stress echo guidelines that were published in JACE in 2020 recommend that the baseline images prior to doing the stress should include the screening assessment of cardiac structure and function. So look at segmental and global ventricular function, chamber sizes, wall thicknesses, and valves, unless an echocardiogram has recently been performed. And so we can find a lot of information and make many diagnoses just based on those rest images. It makes the test just very effective and versatile. These are diagnoses that we've made beyond coronary disease. Certainly we've recognized diastolic dysfunction as a cause for exertional symptoms of shortness of breath, valvular disease that might've been unsuspected, pericardial disease, we found atrial septal defects, pulmonary hypertension, left ventricular hypertrophy and evidence of hypertensive heart disease, cardiomyopathies, including apical hypertrophs, and aortic dissection. So here's a patient who came for a stress echo. This patient had had a nuclear perfusion study elsewhere that was normal, but continued to have somewhat atypical chest pain. And so he came to us and was referred for a stress echo. You can see that he's got mild left ventricular hypertrophy, but the sonographer was immediately concerned about the proximal aorta appearing a bit dilated and is there a double density here? And so instead of doing the stress test, we performed a transesophageal echocardiogram on this patient. And you can see that there is a proximal aortic dissection. So another great pickup for stress echo, and really another example where you wouldn't particularly want to do a symptom-limited exercise test. Stress echo is also versatile in that we can do it with treadmill exercise, and that is our usual form of exercise if the patient can do a treadmill test. Um, patients are more familiar with treadmill exercise compared to bicycle exercise, and most U.S. citizens do better with um, treadmill exercise. They're just able to achieve a higher workload compared to bicycle exercise. But bicycle exercise 
does have an advantage uh, in patients where you want to get additional Doppler information because you have more time to acquire it while the patient is exercising. And then for patients who can't exercise, we do pharmacologic stress testing with dobutamine, but some centers use vasodilators. We sometimes program the patient's pacemaker and do if the heart rate doesn't increase with dobutamine, if they're pacemaker dependent and use a combination of dobutamine and the pacemaker. Both bicycle and dobutamine have this great advantage that we can do imaging throughout stress to determine the ischemic threshold. That is the heart rate at which ischemia first occurs. So that is um, very useful. Our anesthesiologists use that for perioperative management of patients with coronary disease who are having non-cardiac surgery. This is the dobutamine stress echo protocol. You can see that at three minute stages intervals, the dobutamine dose is increased. The peak dose is 40 micrograms per kilogram per minute. We use up to two milligrams of atropine at peak stress to get their heart rate to target, which is 85% of the age predicted maximum heart rate. These are the endpoints, that heart rate, peak dose, wall motion abnormalities, intolerable symptoms, arrhythmia or marked blood pressure abnormality. You can also evaluate myocardial viability with dobutamine stress echocardiography. In this case, we are looking at a wall motion abnormality that is present at rest, and we're looking at its response to increasing doses of dobutamine. In the case of a scar, there's no augmentation with increasing doses. In the case of stunned myocardium, there'll be an augmentation with low dose and persistent augmentation with high dose. Whereas in hibernating myocardium, the area that is subtended by a tight stenosis, you will see some augmentation with low dose dobutamine and then reworsening, and that's because dobutamine increases myocardial blood flow, reworsening with higher doses. And we look at this, whenever we see a segment on the rest echo that is uh, severely hypokinetic, we'll look for the response to low dose. Much of the work on prognostic value of stress echo was conducted our, at our institution. We noted early on that it's only a small percentage of patients that go on to have coronary angiography after a stress test, but we wanted to know what happened to all of them. And so th this was the results of follow-up of patients with a normal exercise echo. You can see that their observed survival was really excellent and better than age and sex match controls from life tables. Of course, some patients from life tables can't exercise, and that puts them at a higher risk. But over the median follow-up of about two years, the risk of cardiac death, myocardial infarction, or coronary revascularization was less than 1% per year. And I think that information is very helpful to have when you're counseling your patients less than 1% per year with a normal exercise echo. We've also looked at the prognostic value of stress echo in many other populations. We've looked at it with pharmacologic and exercise testing. We've looked in both sexes, the elderly, patients with diabetes, chronic kidney disease, peripheral arterial disease, after coronary revascularization, and in patients with different symptom complexes, chest pain versus dyspnea. It was of prognostic value and independent to clinical risk factors in all of these groups. This is work from another group looking at exercise echo in patients with left bundle branch block. And indeed, ischemia in these patients was able to identify those at higher risk.
factors associated with increased risk with stress echo include a poor exercise capacity. Whenever we do a multivariable analysis with exercise testing, exercise capacity comes out as being prognostically important. So for those of you who haven't adopted an exercise program, you should make it part of your New Year's resolutions. Failure to reach target heart rate is also important, particularly in patients having pharmacologic stress testing. Resting left ventricular dysfunction, extensive ischemia, a decrease in ejection fraction with stress, and an increase in end systolic volume with stress were all markers of a higher risk group. And we report each of these with our stress tests. Now, prior to the use of ultrasound image enhancing agents, we had a higher failure rate of echocardiography, some patients that we just could not image. But these enhancing agents um, are these tiny micro bubbles about the size of a red blood cell. And so they, with intravenous injection, will opacify the left ventricle and you can see that it really nicely outlines the borders of the heart here. This was a frail elderly woman with multiple risk factors who was referred for a dobutamine stress echo. You can see that in this apical four chamber view, left ventricular function is preserved at rest, but we already start to get some dysynergy with low dose dobutamine, 10 micrograms, and at 20 micrograms, the apex is clearly ischemic. And as we continue to image, you can see that the apex, the wall motion abnormality becomes even larger and more severe. So really a high risk finding here and indicative of multivessel disease. We've been interested in the patients that have abnormal echoes but without significant angiographic disease and wanted to see what happened to those patients. We defined false positive studies as those with an angiographic stenosis of less than 50%. And we looked at the outcomes, the survival of patients who had coronary angiography within 30 days of their dobutamine stress echo. And some of these dobutamine studies were markedly positive. These are not, were not just little, little borderline equivocal findings, but really markedly abnormal. These patients though, on all comers, had a higher risk compared to normal patients. And their risk was similar to that of patients with angiographic, angiographically significant disease. So I think that a positive stress echo is identifying microvascular abnormalities, small vessel disease, endothelial dysfunction, and vasomotor changes that require treatment uh, and risk factor modification. So anyone with a positive stress echo, regardless of their coronary angiogram, really deserves risk factor modification for their best care. These are data on the temporal change in frequency of normal and of abnormal and ischemic spec testing. And these data are from um, New York and California, a multi center study. And you can see that over time, from 1991 to 2009, they just saw a much a very significant decline in the prevalence of ischemia and abnormalities of spec testing. This trend was preserved in all age and symptom subgroups. And they noted over the same period of time that there was a greater use of pharmacologic stress and pharmacologic stress was more likely to be abnormal than exercise stress. So it wasn't a problem of pharmacologic not picking up disease. But we've observed this in our stress testing laboratories at Mayo Clinic also. So something has changed in the um, prevalence of coronary disease that is coming to our laboratories for stress testing. It may be that we are, um, that this is 
overall improvement in care of patients with suspected coronary disease or risk factor modification. Now we've talked mostly about applying stress echo and stress testing to ischemic heart disease. But the real advantage of stress echo is its versatility and the way we can apply it to all these other forms of disease. Here we're looking at rest and exercise images side by side. This is obviously a normal study. And I might add that we're just looking at a capsule of the information here when we look at these quad screen views. In our stress echo lab, we look at the whole, <clears throat> excuse me, stream of information with after stress. So we're looking at multiple cardiac cycles, a whole video stream of data that is started when the patient steps off the treadmill. But we can evaluate diastolic function, detect pulmonary hypertension. It's useful in patients with cardiomyopathy. You can distinguish um, cardiomyopathy from athletes' hearts, which both may be dilated at rest, and the athletes' hearts clearly become better with stress. You can also use it for hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy if the um, gradient is not sig significant at baseline. You can look at the right heart in patients with congenital heart disease. We've applied it to valvular heart disease, and I'll show some examples and combinations. So all of these with coronary artery disease. Regarding the diastolic stress testing, we measure the mitral inflow E velocity and tissue Doppler mitral annulus E prime. In a normal heart with exercise, both of these will go up. And so the ratio of the two is unchanged. However, in the patient with an abnormal heart, the stroke volume cannot be increased without increasing the filling pressure. Um, so the normal heart can augment relaxation and develop greater diastolic suction. But if this doesn't happen, the E velocity goes up, the E prime cannot, and so the ratio goes up. And this is associated with dyspnea. This is our protocol. Uh, we use 25 watt increments when we're doing a supine bike study. We look at wall motion first, then we do the mitral inflow measurements, um, mitral annulus measured next, and then we calculate these um, numbers later, but we also measure the TR velocity. And we measure these in recovery too, because sometimes there are fused at peak exercise. We also measure oxygen saturation with a pulse oximeter if that has not been done. Here's an example, a 73-year-old woman with exertional dyspnea, hypertension on a diuretic. You can see that her exercise echo, as far as the wall motion goes, really looks normal. Her oxygen saturation was fine, ECG was negative. But here are her hemodynamics. They're really kind of equivocal at baseline. The E to E prime ratio was 11. But with exercise, you can see that her E velocity went up, the E prime stayed the same, and so the ratio went up to 21. TR velocity also went up very significantly in this patient with diastolic dysfunction as a cause for her symptoms of exertional dyspnea. And so when we looked at patients with exercise limiting dyspnea who were referred for a stress echo and considered all the information that we collect at the stress echo, we found that by adding this assessment of pulmonary hypertension, that is the TR velocity, and adding this E to E prime data, we were able to increase the yield of stress echo. And I think this is really important when you consider that the overall yield of just looking for ischemia with the Rosansky study seems to have declined. 
So when we add the looking for diastolic dysfunction, um, the yield of stress testing comes out to be much higher. And we found some sort of abnormality in the majority of patients who came for a stress echo, even though only 27% had ischemia. Another emerging application is lung ultrasound. And we've added this recently to our stress echo um, protocol. Although there are, the full protocol involves looking at eight different windows, four on each side of the chest, we've been doing an abbreviated protocol looking at four sites at rest and with stress. And in this patient with, uh, who developed shortness of breath, you can see that there's evidence of pulmonary vascular congestion manifested by these V-lines, these comet tail artifacts that occur when there's um, increased pulmonary vascular congestion. I just wanted to mention briefly myocardial perfusion with stress testing and with echocardiography. This is a rest echo of a um, frail elderly woman with a non-ST elevation myocardial infarction. And there was some reluctance to do coronary angiography because of her elevated creatinine. And you can see that there's a really significant large wall motion abnormality here involving the apex. However, the perfusion of these segments appears to be nearly normal when we do um, flash imaging, destroy the bubbles, you can see that the bubbles opacify the myocardium very quickly in both the four chamber and long axis view, suggesting that perfusion is normal or preserved intact in this patient. And indeed, at follow-up echocardiography a month later, the function has recovered in those segments. I think this technique will likely increasingly be used, particularly as we have more automated and standard ways of assessing perfusion. So we use stress echo to sort out all sorts of different conditions. And this is a figure from the ASE EACVI clinical recommendations for stress testing in non-ischemic conditions. There are so many things that we can measure that you really have to have a plan tailored to your patient. And our uh, expert sonographers will come and ask us how we would like to conduct the examination when we, we have a referral for mitral regurgitation or valvular disease. And sometimes we even evaluate patients with mixed and multivalvular disease plus ischemia. Um, but there's so many things you can measure. Um, you can't measure all of this, you run out of time. But, but this is with a bicycle exercise, you can certainly measure mitral regurgitation, gradients, PA pressures, as well as EDE primes and wall motion abnormalities. In valvular disease, the guidelines suggest that you can do an exercise test if the patient is reportedly asymptomatic and you want to see if they really do have any exercise limitations. Um, this can be important and sometimes patients with severe valvular disease will actually have an obvious exercise limitation if they are subjected to stress. On the other hand, if the patient is symptomatic, but their symptoms seem disproportionate to the valve disease at rest, stress testing can be helpful. Rheumatic mitral stenosis is one such case. And the class of, or strength of recommendation for that is considered uh, level one. And in primary mitral regurgitation and symptoms that might be attributable, hemodynamic exercise testing is also considered reasonable with a class of recommendation of 2A. And even in chronic secondary mitral regurgitation, stress echo can be useful to establish the etiology of mitral regurgitation and assess viability. 
and that was a, a level one. So here's some examples from our practice. This is a 60-year-old woman who had balloon mitral valvuloplasty 11 years previously and now had developed dyspnea. Here are her resting hemodynamics. You can see that the mean gradient across the mitral valve was eight millimeters mercury and the mitral valve area is 1.5 centimeters squared. So moderate mitral stenosis. You can see her left ventricular systolic function is normal, right ventricular systolic pressure was upper normal. And with her supine bike exercise echo, you can see that wall motion was normal at rest and with stress. Using B color here to enhance visual discrimination of the walls. But look what happens with stress. At 100 watts, you can see that her gradient across the mitral valve goes way up to 30 millimeters mercury mean gradient. And her right ventricular systolic pressure went up to 70 millimeters mercury. So clearly this explains her symptoms in this patient head mitral valve replacement. Dobutamine has also been used in low gradient aortic stenosis, particularly in patients with reduced ejection fraction. And in that group, uh, the class of recommendation is considered a 2A. With dobutamine and reduced ejection fraction, we give low doses of dobutamine and measure the stroke volume response, mean aortic valve gradient, and the valve area. And this is particularly for patients who have a valve area less than one at baseline, but a mean gradient that isn't that high presumably because of their left ventricular dysfunction. And we look for contractile reserve, an increase in the stroke volume by 20%. You could also do this with a low level of exercise, such as the supine bicycle exercise. And in the patient with severe aortic stenosis and flow reserve, stroke volume goes up, mean gradient goes up, the valve area stays the same. And those patients will benefit the most from having valve intervention. In the case of secondary mitral regurgitation, stress echo can be applied to patients with exertional dys dyspnea that seems disproportional to their mitral regurgitation at rest, or in patients who have had unexplained pulmonary edema or if they have intermediate severity of mitral regurgitation and are scheduled for bypass grafting. It can also be, if you're trying to decide whether to um, fix the mitral valve at the time of cabbage, it can also be used to evaluate persistent pulmonary hypertension after mitral valve repair. Here's an interesting example. This is a patient with left bundle branch block that developed only with exercise. And you can see the abnormal appearance of the mitral valve here. This patient had no significant coronary disease, but developed severe mitral regurgitation with exercise in the setting of left bundle branch block and with, was treated with CRT pacing. So stress echo can really help you sort out all sorts of puzzles. Here's its uh, application in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Of course, a gradient of more than 50 millimeters mercury is the threshold for intervention in symptomatic patients. And so there, our echo lab will do the measurement of gradient at rest. If it's less than 50, we'll do the Valsalva maneuver. Then we try amyl nitrite. Um, if we don't have access to amyl nitrite, we'll try the squat to stand position in the transthoracic lab. And if all of this is negative in a symptomatic patient that we're still trying to understand, we'll do an exercise echo, trying to get to this 50 millimeter mercury gradient. Here's an example of an exercise echo in a patient. Um, you can see that there's a dynamic obstruction but it's not particularly high here at rest. 
but with stress, and when we had this patient stand up after stress testing, um, because that was what we would, would, he said would reproduce his symptoms, he develops this marked SAM with torrential posteriorly directed mitral regurgitation and a very high uh, gradient. One of the big limitations of stress echo is that the interpretation has mostly been subjective. But this is getting better in that uh, we can apply technologies such as strain to the images and even applying it to rest images might help us detect subclinical coronary disease in some patients. It has been applied with stress and you can see here the global strain um, became abnormal, more abnormal in this patient. There was also reduced strain in um, patients in the LAD distribution in this example. But what's really exciting about stress echo is the potential role for artificial intelligence to interpret the image. And great progress has been made in this. Um, view classifications have been developed, um, different features of the images have been selected. And this paper just came out in December in Jack Cardiovascular Imaging, where artificial intelligence was applied simply to the quad screen images, just the rest and stress images, and did extremely well in detecting uh, coronary artery disease. This is a very interesting paper. The AUROC in testing was 0.93, really amazing. And then when they added the, the um, artificial intelligence to help the clinician, it augmented the clinician's accuracy in interpreting the stress echo. So in summary, I think stress echo continues to have an important role in the era of multimodality imaging. We can do it with exercise or pharmacologic stress. Exercise is preferred if the patient can exercise. It now has a very high feasibility when we use contrast. We use contrast in about 40% of our dobutamines and about a quarter of our exercise tests. Feasibility is now oh, about 99%. It is very safe and you can make many diagnoses on the rest images alone. It is very efficient for the patient. The results are available almost immediately. We can detect and apply it to coronary disease, valve disease, diastolic function and cardiomyopathy. And I think these ongoing efforts with artificial intelligence and quantitation are going to continue to increase its reproducibility and reduce variability. And so with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I would be delighted to take any questions. And thank happy you. new year. Thank you so much. That was an amazing lecture. And uh, I want to invite all our, our fellows to read also the guidelines that you wrote for, for stress echo recently published uh, 2020, now not last year. So uh, Dr. Garcia is with some of our fellows. We're trying to encourage our fellows to participate as well. So I let them go with the first question. Good morning. Hi, Dr. Federica. This is Saul. I'm one of the secondary fellows here at Montefiore. Thank you for this uh, amazing talk. I guess as, as fellows, we always want to use the, the latest technology and uh, CCTA has been something that has been on our minds recently. So thank you for reminding us the amount of information that we can get through stress echo. Uh, I was particularly fascinated by uh, how can you evaluate the diastolic function uh, dynamically or how can you see viability for some patients just by doing stress echo. Uh, I guess uh, cases that I've seen on, on my consult service are patients that come for an unrelated issue with no clear chest pain, but they produce troponins. Uh, we want to test these patients to see if they have significant CAD. Uh, would the presence of troponins be a contraindication for stressing a patient and uh, taking the patient with stress echo? 
let's say they don't have any clear chest pain or uh, any other concern for a, an acute coronary syndrome, but just the fact that they have troponins would be a contraindication for, for a stress echo? Thanks for that question. Yes, it, it is true. We see all kinds of patients and, and sometimes they have risk factors and kidney disease and elevated troponins and um, and, and of course, your careful clinical assessment about the patient is important in whether it's uh, safe to proceed. But that is one of the nice things about stress echo because you are looking at the walls, you get this look at everything. And, and um, if we see wall motion abnormalities at rest that are um, unsuspected or new, um, then you don't need to even do the stress test. So that's the nice thing about um, the cardiologist that reads the stress test and the stress echo sonographers that know what they're looking for. And we're all kind of on the same page to help each other and do the right thing for the patient. And even for patients that have um, pharmacologic stress, you know, some, sometimes you think, I think this is going to be positive, or I'm not sure if that, that inferior wall looks just a little borderline. And then you just start giving the, giving the dobutamine and it declares itself. And so you don't need to um, take the patient to maximum heart rate. You, you've got your answer very quickly. So I think it is a very, very safe test and very practical to use in patients, even if the troponin may be equivocal. Thank you. Uh, hi, Dr. Phillips. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. I'm Chris I want to first year fellows. Uh, my question is, um, how often would you encounter a negative threat of stress echo in someone with critical ischemia or triple blood flow disease and dialysis treatment? So that's a good question. How often do we find a negative stress echo in someone with, with severe disease? So that would be very uncommon. I think that the potential things that could cause um, a false negative study would be if the patient exercised extremely poorly or if you absolutely couldn't move the heart rate with, um, with dibutamine. Um, but those things are pretty uncommon. You know, the, the limitation of nuclear perfusion in patients with severe disease has been that you can get this balanced hypoperfusion. And so you have no normal area of perfusion really to compare it with. And so you can at least theoretically miss um, multivessel disease. Now, my colleagues in nuclear cardiology say this is super rare because you can see dilatation of the heart. Um, but we have seen patients who have had nuclear perfusion studies and do have a positive stress echo because with stress echo, you don't miss the dilatation of the heart. It's very easy to recognize on the side-by-side -side images. Patricia, first of all, thank you so much for uh, uh, this opportunity of sharing an hour with you. And our apology for the technical difficulties at the beginning, I was stressing out uh, and remembering that uh, uh, some of the uh, initial work with the stress testing also involved non-exercise modalities to provoke stress, uh, including mental stress tests. So I was having uh, I had probably a, a negative mental stress uh, test uh, while I was trying to set up this conference this morning with you. Um, I had so many questions and I, I know when I go into anything that is controversial because at the end of the day, arguing whether one test is better than the other really doesn't bring that much knowledge uh, to the table. This, this, all these tests, anatomical and functional imaging are complementary and sometimes one is better than the other. But the one question that I, that I want to uh, make you is, is technical. We see very often uh, a patient with significant disease where we can detect ischemia on the first image acquired. And by the second image 
Only a few seconds later, when we moved from APCAR 4 to APCAR 2, the images become completely normal. And then, of course, the parasternal are completely normal. And, um, you know, as you know, Petero in, 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 uh, in, in uh, Spain proposes uh, the use of peak exercise imaging. Matias uh, uses uh, sometimes, uh, I believe, atropine to try to uh, increase heart rate. But, you know, so, some of these things are difficult uh, to do technically. Do you recommend that we push the exercise heart rate beyond the 85% and try to get it close as possible to 100% to try to minimize the risk that we are, um, you know, going too late to take the images at peak? Thank you for that great question. Um, yes, our protocol is really to push the patient to maximal exercise till they can't exercise anymore, till they are exhausted or until they have their exertional symptom. And so we would not start stop for a target heart rate. And I think by really pushing to the maximal exercise capacity of the patient, that is where you are going to get the best yield of the test. And of course, it, we've done stress tests in some um, professional athletes, and sometimes they only get their symptoms at maximum exercise. And so if you stop for a target heart rate, you miss the whole thing. Um, and these may be non-ischemic symptoms, but something else that's going on um, in the patient. But that's, um, I think, a good point to, to try to, to do a maximal stress test. We do use the target heart rate for dobutamine, having like a lack of any other particular endpoint. But I'd like to see that they've at least continued it, it so we've seen all the different views at that maximum heart rate, um, at the target heart rate. We've tried giving atropine at, um, um, before exercise to see if we could prevent that exponential plummet of heart rate that occurs when the patient steps off the treadmill. But, but no, it, it's still... Um, it still dropped exponentially. Um, it didn't have much effect. Um, and, and then if we've also looked at um, what, how you should classify ischemia, because sometimes you can only see it in one segment and then, and then it's recovering, like, like you pointed out, other views don't show the abnormality. And we did find that our best um, accuracy of the test was when there was a single segment with ischemia. And so we will call it even if that's the case. But I think all these are important issues. It will, be, it will be really interesting when the artificial intelligence is used more broadly, um, as I, I think it might be um, helpful and interesting to apply even for expert reviewers. Thank you very much. Uh, going to that point, in the in the new guidelines uh, uh, that you wrote, uh, the the target heart rate in the key points was reduced to eighty percent uh, at least to reach. Is that something that should be the same for for exercise and dobutamine? Do you think there are any differences, and why did you guys decide to decrease that target? You know, I, I don't think that heart rate should be used as a target for exercise testing, except as um, if they don't get to the target heart rate, um, then I think that is a limitation of the test that should be called out in the report. Patient did not achieve target heart rate or exercise, exercise capacity was limited. And these things could reduce the sensitivity of the test for detection of coronary disease. I'll put that in my report. but. Our staff are instructed to take the patient to maximum symptoms, not to stop for target heart rate. And I would use 85% for dobutamine, not 80. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have a question from Dr. Goldberg. Uh, he says, excellent talk, thank you. During stress echo, why do you prefer medial E prime over lateral or average E prime? Oh, it's just a practical, um, practicality. I suppose 
that um, you could do medial and lateral. I probably would not average them, but would look at them separately because sometimes there's some reason for one to be abnormal and rather than the other, uh, like aortic valve surgery or a lateral wall motion abnormality. But it, it becomes um, just a practicality for what you measure and what you have time to measure while the patient is exercising. But I think um, either one could be useful. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have uh, another question from Agustin Cois Coisnes. Hopefully I'm pronouncing it well. So thank, thanks for a lot for this brilliant presentation. And he asked in, in valvular heart disease, how do you quantify exercise limitation, given that there is no reference values in exercise echo? For exercise limitation, we look, I look to see if the patient has achieved at least 80% of their functional aerobic capacity. And that is based on um, age and sex norms for the boost protocol. And so if patients haven't exercised well, then I will put that in my report. Um, even though that isn't, those norms were developed by Bruce, not particularly for um, valve disease, but really for what a healthy man or woman should be able to do. Um, but it's, there's nothing really magic about 80%. Of course, it's a continuum. The more, the better the test, the more the patient exercises. I think you feel most confident in your results if the patient has exercised well. Another thing that people sometimes wonder about is what happens, is the test still, is an exercise echo still valid if the heart rate plummets in recovery while you're trying to get um, the post-exercise images? And I think it is. You know, um, if the patient has exercised well and the heart rate drops like a rock, that is prognostically a good sign. And I would still consider the test unless there was some unusual delay in acquiring the images, I would still consider it a diagnostic study. Thank you very much. And uh, I really enjoy in particular reading the, your latest studies with, uh, with Ultramics on the use of, of strain and the use of AI on strain. Uh, do you think uh, this will be generalizable? How easy is to, to for the AI to actually pick up the, the strain in stress echo? Is it a lot of uh, images that are not analyzable or most of them can be analyzed? Because it seems very promising. I think. Their, um, their yield for uh, diagnostic quality images was, was really very high. So, um, I think we still need more information about this and and more testing and trial, but but it is extremely exciting. Actually, uh, along those lines, uh, uh, you know, Ultronics, if, if I'm correct, uh, can do the analysis on, on Daikon images, uh, which are downgraded to a frame rate that is much more in yeah, my opinion, maybe too low for, uh, for a stress echo because at the end of the day, you will have maybe three or four frames per uh, systolic portion of the cardiac cycle at a peak heart rate. Do you still think that with that limited frame rate, we can pick up a uh, uh, difference in, 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 in a strain? It, it is hard to know. It was in their... Um paper that is in Jack Imaging, it wasn't just strain that they use, they use other features, um, really looked at a very large number of features and then selected, I think 30 or so that seemed to be most associated with, um, with ischemia. Um, so it's hard to know how exactly what is inside the black box, but, um, of AI that is interpreting the images, but but it's interesting and certainly merits further further assessment. Well, thank you very much. That was an ex excellent lecture, and we hope to have you in person soon. And sorry again for the late start. No problem. Great to see you. Thanks for the opportunity to visit with you, and I hope to see you in person. 
Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.